So tonight at our 291st uh, Civic Hack Night, um, we actually have Keith, Keith Liu, um, and he's here to present how the pandemic forced healthcare to go digital. Um, Keith is a, a scale-up advisor and venture builder who is heavily involved in the Canadian tech startup community. He mentors, consults, uh, and advises out of several business incubators and accelerators in, in the GTA. And he has more than 20 years of experience working with firms um, like Apple, Logitech, and Microsoft, but was also co-founder of Canada's first fractional chief technology officer service. Um, so Keith has worked with some of the world's largest organizations to build their data and AI strategies and innovation labs. Um, we're super excited to have him here tonight to speak about his, um, his new company that's using, uh, using AI and working with government um, to improve healthcare services. So uh, yeah, if, if folks do want to come off mute or I don't know, like, yeah, feel free to like turn off mute and, 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 you know, if this is, sorry, that's a new thing. I, I, I let's, I feel like that would not work. <laughs> we'll save that until after. Uh, so anyway, the floor the floor is yours, Lou. Um, yeah, you I, I would have, actually, um, ability to present. I would actually highly recommend uh, coming off mute um, and feel free to you know get on camera. I think making this a conversation and a dialogue is certainly much better. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, question, comments, if you want to throw a virtual tomato at me, it's all good. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. I have about 150 page uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm a former Microsoft employee. There will be a quiz after this. I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, you know, it, again, very informal, nothing too crazy. I just wanted to have a chat um, with you all. And again, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we're going we're gonna to be talking tonight is really how the pandemic has forced the world to go digital with the healthcare and certainly um, us in Canada. And we're gonna talk about some of the challenges we've had and what, what, the, what life was like pre-pandemic, um, what the pandemic has done um, to the healthcare system in Canada um, and what the future looks like and what are some of the things that are happening. And I'll introduce to some of the things that uh, we are doing, which we're very excited about. And we have a couple, a few members of the team here, I see, so this should be cool. But again, feel free to jump in any time and don't mind me if I sound hoarse or my energy goes away, if I cough really crazily. Um, I'm still recovering from a bad bout of um, COVID. And this, I think this previous week was the first week I could take meetings. And so it's been uh, still pretty rough. So talking and breathing have been difficult simultaneously. So I'll figure it out. <laughs> so, you know, before we can talk about how the pandemic forced healthcare to go digital, we really want to talk about what life was like before the pandemic, right? And it, interestingly, we think about pre-pandemic as this awesome state. You know, we want to go back to how things were uh, before the pandemic. And so, well, how was life before the pandemic? When we think about it from, you know, a healthcare perspective, you know, according, and according to the Canadian Association of Psoriasis Patients, a benchmark for access to dermatologist established in 2001 is five weeks. That is, you're supposed to wait, we are supposed to wait, five weeks. And it is very clear that to this day, we still have not hit five weeks. And if you think about the times that we've had to wait um, for a dermatologist or another specialist, um, you know, there are a lot of horror stories of I've had to wait three months or I've had to wait, right, four months or six months sometimes. Um, and it's kind of crazy. And this is the world <coughs> before the pandemic. In fact, before COVID, it took over 20 weeks on average between referring and, from a general practitioner, from someone like your family doctor, and receipt of treatment from a specialist. 20 weeks is the actual time, whereas the recommend, recommended time is five. Um, so we're, we're quite a bit off. Um, and again, this was pre-pandemic. And we think about pre-pandemic, you know, what are the other ways that we can access doctors? How can we go and see our doctors aside from the traditional ways? Of course, you can also do something like um, telemed. Some of you might be familiar with the OTN, um, Ontario Telemedicine Network, which is essentially a phone, <laughs> a phone line that we can dial. And uh, 
is that me? Um, it's an, just a number that we can dial and uh, you know, they'd be talking to you about your, your specific illness. Now, if any of you have actually used OTN, like I've had the pleasure of doing, unfortunately, they don't have doctors on the OTN. And so what we typically have are nurses who try to triage. And usually um, you have a choice of, you know, the, this is the, these are the symptoms that I have and the, the nurse cannot give you a diagnosis. And then what they would probably recommend you to do is go see a doctor or go to the emergency room. Um, unfortunately, then you just basically added time, um, you know, to my medical challenge that I'm having. And so OTN has been, again, I don't want to poo-poo on, on a government service, but uh, it generally, generally not seen as a major success. Um, and COVID, with COVID coming, it certainly really highlighted that. Um, at the end of the day, it wasn't an opportunity to speak with a doctor and to figure out what to do with you know, this bad cough that you might have, right? Or this really bad bump that you have in your skin. And that's not what it's for. And so again, it's, that's how you see doctors, right? This is pre-pandemic, the good old days, what we all want to get back to. Um, this is the world that awaits us. And then of course, the last way that we can go and, and maybe see doctors non-traditionally, maybe not waiting weeks at a time, is perhaps going into a walk-in clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I live in, previously I've lived in Richmond Hills. And so it's a lot easier for me to actually go to a walk-in clinic than to drive to my family doctor who's in downtown Toronto. And so I would always go to my walk-in clinic. Unfortunately, walk-in clinics, um, they aren't always open. Now, some of them open later, but there's no like late night um, walk-in clinics are quite rare. Um, and you know, weekends, some of the hours are missing. And so these walk-in clinics, more often than not, you're gonna say, sorry, we're closed. Come back another time, which kind of, again, defeats the purpose of the walk-in clinic, in my opinion. And this is what we're all, <clears throat> you know, I think I'm not the only one who dreams of, you know, life um, before the pandemic. But, you know, if you think about it, this was the world that we were living in. And unfortunately, this was a world that we were more than willing to live. Um, you know, that's just life, right? Hey, waiting, waiting 20 weeks, at least at three, um, and uh, we get to see a doctor and they're good doctors. Um, but that is the world pre pandemic. Then of course, COVID hit. Um, and COVID has been really rough. And it's been, and it's been a really bad strain and on the system. And, <laughs> That's personally, as you can probably hear from me, um, but COVID has not been easy. Um, and it certainly put a huge, huge strain um, on our medical um, and our healthcare system. And, you know, here's a, an interesting study where I think it was just an informal anecdotal survey um, for, you know, cancer patients. And of the patients that were sur surveyed, 54% of them had their cancer care appointments canceled, postponed, or rescheduled because of COVID-19. 54%. That's really bad if you have cancer. Um, and the same was reported about 75% of pre-diagnosis or recently diagnosed patients, um, <laughs> which again is really scary. Imagine having you know, you were just diagnosed with cancer, whatever kind it is. I don't think it ever is like easy. And then your next appointment is canceled or rescheduled or you know, postponed six months or nine months. Um, and that's a real problem. And anecdotally, we're seeing uh, significant delays across the country. Um, even in Ottawa, um, I think we were speaking with dermatologists there there's an 18 month wait to see a term. And 18 months is a really long time if you have a serious disease. Um, if you have something like a stage four melanoma or melanoma, you, know, there's, you have like a two year span and having to wait 18 months of it before you can actually get the help that you need, that's a real problem. Um, and unfortunately that's, the world that we're living in currently. 
And really what we're seeing now is the longest wait times in modern era in Canada. And there are over 1.2 million patients have lost over $2.8 billion in wages because of our delays. And I apologize, it's not meant to be all doom and gloom, but I wanted to just paint the picture in terms of this is what's causing change. Um, and we're hearing about it on the news all the time, um, but something needs to change when it comes to healthcare. And take it from someone who's had family in ICU and someone who's passed away from COVID, you know, something has to change. Keith, if I, if I just may add uh, just here is that the reality of this is so ridiculous. Unless you have personally faced this or a family member close to you has faced this, it, it's not even possible to, to imagine like, because you're in such a situation and having to wait 18 months, um, it's just, you know, very, very difficult, not just, you know, from a physical standpoint, but also from the emotional and stress point, right? Well, 100%, you know, and, and thanks for interrupting. Um, I, I've, I've said this jokingly quite a few times uh, whenever I talk about schematopathy. This has been the most emotional I have ever been in my 20 something year career. You know, I've worked in a lot of initiatives. I've worked in um, biotech and I've, I've worked in a lot of different types of companies. But when you meet people, and they tell you, you know, and you see the stuff that they have to go through or that they have went through, or that they tell you, hey, it's been a year since I've been diagnosed with a cancer and I still haven't been able to see someone to take care of it, right? And I was, I've been planning my funeral or something like that. And, you know, it just gets to, right? Like this is the world that we live in right now. And it's, and it's unfortunate. And again, I think it's <clears throat> to the point where we're saying we need to do something to change that. Um, you know, and, and we're in the right community, right? Civic Tech CEO, we are the community that has to step in and we have to do something. And so, but it, it's, it's quite interesting. And this literally came out yesterday. In Ontario, by September, 2021, the surgery backlog, just Ontario, just our province, 419,000. The diagnostic backlog, just to see if you have something, or what is it that you have, 2.5 million. And the time it's going to take to clear this backlog is three and a half years. That's a long time. And again, unacceptable. We need to do something to change this. And, um, and so, you know, there's a few people here who, you know, work with us and, and I think we're all actively trying to do something about this. But I think, you know, the more people that we can um, get committed to, you know, help us change, I think would be a great thing and highly welcome. And this is, you know, the crappy part <clears throat> about um, the pandemic. And this is the crappy part about um, you know, healthcare in Canada and, and unfortunately where we are in Ontario. But it's not all bad news. Um, I think all of this doom and gloom has led to a lot of really interesting things to happen. And I think um, you know, governments are, our government is looking at this and, and you gotta say, hey, you appreciate at least that they're doing something about it. And you know, so one of the things that we are, uh, uh, the federal government is doing is they're investing 46 million into expanding virtual healthcare in Ontario, just Ontario, just our province. I mean, all the, they're investing in all of them, right? But to, to at least know that the federal government is helping the provincial government um, to drive something forward um, is amazing. And so we're, we're seeing that. And even on a provincial level, um, you know, we hear about, you know, Doug Ford cutting uh, healthcare investments and healthcare budgets, but Ontario is also investing $14.5 million. And so, you know, there is money going into it. Um, and uh, you're seeing it, we are seeing it through different types of grants, different types of innovation grants, um, you know, a variety of different things, activities that are happening. And with the new budget that was just announced in April, 
um, we're seeing this investment starting to trickle, trickle down into the various innovations that we can do. And you're seeing a variety of community projects, of startups, of course, government, government and public investment that are making a big difference. Um, but overall, at least the investment into virtual healthcare, into being able to actually talk to or see a doctor online, a doctor and not just a nurse. And again, not downplaying what a nurse, nurse does, we need our nurses, but actually being able to speak with the doctor, um, you know, doctor being able to actually get paid for this is something that's a huge benefit for us um, as Canadians. And so that's really cool. And this is not just in Ontario. And this is not just in Canada. Um, the investment into remote health or telehealth, as they call it, is really three things. There's remote monitoring, remote consulting, and remote education, right? Monitoring, think about, you know, imagine uh, some sort of remote device or software. Remote consultation is the actual consultation with a doctor. And remote education, you know, where you can actually learn about hey, you know what, you have cancer, this is actually what you should be doing with your specific type of cancer. This is the follow-up, this is the type of treatment. But this, this industry of telehealth is growing tremendously and is expected to be a $175 billion market by 2026, um, which is therefore one of the fastest growing um, industries globally, right? And so it's not just in Canada that we know and recognize that something needs to change. I think the world recognizes that we can't do things the way we've always done things. Feel free to interrupt, uh, you know, say anything you wish, disagree with me, completely okay. Can I ask and, a question? Of course. Oh, so how does it work in terms of like in Canada, we have like a public sector of um, like, you know, healthcare. So are these new virtual stuff they're still public or are they private so it, there's, that's a very good question there's a variety of ways it's both right so to the, the long and short answer is it's both and what it is is <clears throat> the public how it's a, how the investment supports public is that you know the way that doctors um get uh, remunerated is that they have to charge ohip right and a fee and Previously, there was no virtual or telehealth code for them to charge. Um, I believe we have doctors on the call, so feel free to interrupt me anytime, Hannah, if I'm incorrect. Um, but sorry, oh, you're here. I'm going to chime in. Yeah, yeah please so do. There was no, um, there was a very limited um, number of occurrences where you can uh, charge or bill for the services you provide via the telehealth network and it was only allowed through a very inundated the system the ontario telehealth network not very many doctors actually um are on it or use it um and then what happened was when COVID hit um they started um expanding and allowing doctors to bill their usual um their usual bills for consultations um on virtual uh consults um, but then it's right now it, we're kind of at this, um, juncture in, in, in our health, um, in our health where it's actually set to, it's actually only temporary. Um, they are providing care for patients virtually, but, um, only allowing doctors to bill for it tempor um, temporarily until September. So, um, but I think what it is, is patients have experienced this um, model of care now for over a year and a half. And so there is a, there is a possibility that we will adopt it um, into our system permanently. And, and thank you. Ben. And, and that is the public side, right? Where, again, where the government's investment into the public side and how, that's how publicly we do it. At the same time, there's the private investment where governments can invest in you know, startups like ours or different uh, companies that are driving innovation that helps with telehealth or digital health in general. Um, and we as Canadians get to benefit from the new processes and new technologies that are built. Right? So there's, there's both a public and a private side to that, uh, Dennis. Okay, so, so as far as you're like the front, uh person is 
a doctor is also always public. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Awesome. Pat, did you put up a hand or was that like a... I guess I just wanted to be the the friendly timekeeper. We we normally set aside twenty for uh for presentation and, and Q and A, and just so you knew to leave time for Q and A after some. What what time are we at? I don't um, about at I think we could go to seven fifty. Although that would be a little bit over. We're just trying to protect the work time since that's kind no, of. No, absolutely. So you know what? I'm I'm gonna uh, run through this, and really we're we're almost done. But basically, the investment in the digital health globally. And the market again, look at the market now, it's about a hundred billion dollar market. 2026, we're expected to grow 6X. And this is global. So this is real, this is not. And so again, the world recognizes that this is something serious. And so there's a lot going on. And in Canada, these are just some of the awesome companies that are creating really awesome technologies. Some of you have probably used already, maybe like Maple or Dialog. Um, you know, some are building some pretty slick technologies like Mimosa, um, which you'll probably see. Well, hopefully you don't ever have. Um, but, you know, the, there are a lot of things coming out of Canada. These are all in Canada. Um, but globally, there is plenty more. So I'll tell you very quickly about us. Uh, so I have a really bad skin disease, psoriasis. It turns into um, arthritis for someone like me. And a few years ago, my doctors told me that my hands would close and seize forever and I won't be able to use them. And they just, they're really deformed. I don't know if you can tell. And so then we had to remove some cartilage from my hand. It was my decision. Um, I went to my specialist and said, let's remove this cartilage. And I see specialists two to three times a year for the past 20 years. And when I was on the operating table, the surgeon that was cutting me open said, hey Keith, you know that thing we're coming out of you? It's not arthritis, it's actually a tumor. Would you like me to remove it? And had I not met that doctor that day on the operating table, I probably wouldn't have my index finger in it, right? Or worse. And so it's kind of crazy, but what kind of hit me there was, hey, maybe doctors don't always know exactly what things are growing on people, especially if you're only seeing them two or three times a year. Um, and you know, the tools that they have are typically more analog than digital. And so it's difficult to track. And um, so this surgeon and I teamed up um, during the pandemic and said, hey, you know what? We're seeing a lot more late stage cancer. Meaning, you know, because people now have to wait 20 plus weeks or nine months or 18 months, those, you know, early stage cancers that you can remove very easily are now turning to stage three and stage four cancers. And because of that, we have to do something about it. And, you know, think about skin cancer as an example, if you catch it early, there's a 99%. You can remove it, all is good. 99% of the time, everything's gonna be fine. But if you let it sit, that can you know, severely harm you, cause pain, cause scars or worse condition, it can kill you. And so you know, we need to do something about this. And so we created a company called Skinopathy. This was last summer. We just came up with some ideas and said, hey, could we take a cell phone and, um, you know, let's take a picture of that bump on your skin and be able to determine whether or not that, that bump is cancerous. And, uh, and so we created some technology and we found, hey, it's actually possible. And so what we did was in September, in, in August, we incorporated our company. In September, we hired our first employee, Rakesh, a data scientist, who's actually on the call um, right now. And we started building technology that allowed anyone to do that. And so um, by December, we started seeing our very first patient um, via getskinhelp.com. Now, um, it was a first service that we decided to release. And basically what it is, <laughs> is that we didn't want to wait until all of this really crazy technology we're building will be available in your hands. And so if you think you have something serious, and maybe you have a bump, but maybe it could be something serious or you're waiting 18 months or something or it's six months and you wanted to make it faster. You go to guestcanhelp.com, you answer all these questions like you would normally, the doctor would normally ask you. You take a few pictures. We will do an analysis with our technology and get you right to the specialist that you need to. And so, you know, we've been operating since December, like offering the service. I think the longest we wait to get to a specialist now is two to three weeks. And the fastest we've ever done is four hours. And I'm saying someone who found us on Google 
had their cancer removed from their skin in four hours from when they found it. And that's a great question, Blendy. Is it free? 100%. This is covered by OHIP, um, covered by, you know, as long as you have a, a, a provincial health plan, so Canadians, covered. On, or if you have UHIP or Blue Cross or whatever, covered. There's no cost to you whatsoever. Um, and so this, this is what we did. And so we've been seeing hundreds of patients since we've been focusing more on building products versus you know, advertising and marketing. <laughs> we're excited about what we're doing. Um, and this month, which is melanoma month, we are now releasing our application. And so later this month, you'll be able to go to you know, the Apple store, or Android store, you'll be able to download get skin help and you'll be able to screen on your phone. And we will tell you with 90% accuracy if you have skin cancer and what type of cancer it may be and how serious it is. And if it is something, you can connect with a specialist directly on our platform and we'll get it checked out. And skin cancer is just the start of what we're doing. We're working with a lot of government agencies and hospitals and medical organizations and pharma and to expand to a lot of other um, skin diseases. But now we are truly a, a skin platform. So if you have anything at all that's worried for your skin, come and see us. Um, I know that we don't want to go over time, so I'm going to stop um, and feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, th thanks so much, Keith. I, uh... Yeah, and uh, I guess I think we have time for one question, but the nice thing about the Hack Night format is that we can have breakout room rooms yeah. if you're willing, like, if you want to, if you can make a pitch during then any, you know, as long as people stick around for questions, we'd love to still have you guys, have you all be able to connect.